Coming up on this week's show, a new fan-made Sonic game for your PC. Play Mario 64 as you've never played it before. And we get the story of Missile Command and more with Atari legend, Rich Allen. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our amazing mates at Bitmap Books. Now, one of their books you should absolutely check out for the summer, Go Straight, The Ultimate Guide to Side-Scrolling Beat-Em-Ups. This colossal guide describes every major game in the genre across 456 vibrant and colourful pages. Check that out and the rest of their retro gaming collection at bitmapbooks.com. And with our lovely friends at PCBWay. Now, if you're working on an electronics project at the moment, they offer a fully featured custom PCB prototype service with low-cost, fast turnaround quality boards. And they offer services like 3D printing and injection molding, and they're big supporters of the retro community. So get an instant quote for your project right now at PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 339, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And welcome to our favourite part of the week, just before the weekend, when we take you on a nostalgic trip back and enjoy some of the best in retro gaming and technology news that there is, update you on all the big stories that have been happening over the last seven days. See, that's the good thing about this show. You don't have to Google around or check Twitter. We let you know what's going on in retro every week. And of course, we are joined by a veteran of the industry for a chat about their career, the companies and the games that they worked on in the second half of the show. Now, we got such a good reaction to our chat with Ed Rotberg from Atari a couple of weeks ago. We thought we'd keep it on a bit of an Atari tip for a while, and chat to another legend who was there back in the heyday of Atari. Yeah, we talked with Rich Adam, and uh, Rich was, like, working on some really early stuff. He worked at NASA before, and um, Mm. he's really got an interesting history. But, you know, one of the main titles that he worked with that I absolutely loved as a kid was Missile Command. I loved being overwhelmed by those kind of missiles coming down. And also... You know, it was one of those really early colour titles and uh, just the trackball as well on the uh, arcade cabinet was wicked. It's funny, when we were talking about it, Joe was like, Missile Command, Terminator 2. <laughs> That's what you thought of, wasn't it? I, li- I couldn't get Terminator 2 off my brain the whole time we were doing the interview. And uh, Dan was like, it's Afterburner he plays. I said, no, but he plays Missile Command before that when they're at the Galleria. And I remember my uncle always used to point out, that's Missile Command that, whenever we used to watch Terminator 2. <laughs> he's a bit older than me. Um, but no, this was really, really cool. And, you know, you mentioned there, like, it was one of the first colour games. And, you know, it was actually really interesting kind of hearing about that and how, like, the concept was like, right, we need a colour game. What are we doing? It was like, okay, maybe mm. we can do missiles. You know, and the questions were really fantastic. So me and Dan did this one, but Ravi did some absolutely excellent research and some questions and... uh there's some really good stuff in there, you know, kind of about like, you know, the impact of kind of like talking about a real life kind of thing, you know, like missile crises and stuff, which were happening in the world at the time. You know, it was a really in-depth conversation, not just about how the game worked and how they came up with the concepts and got the colours to work and all this kind of stuff, but also on the impact it had, you know, and the kind of like the culture at the time and stuff like that. It was just really cool to kind of get that insight of the early 80s and and obviously talk to somebody who, you know, worked with Atari from 1978 and, like you say, yeah. started out from, at NASA from and the, stuff. From uh, the pinball yeah. division as well, which yeah, which yeah. actually collapsed and then kind of went into this area. But you're right, it was a really dark theme for a game, mm. wasn't it? And, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, re- really kind of edgy to release that. And also we talk about Gravatar that was the follow-up to it as well. Um, and, you know, that was kind of the first, I think it was colour vector game, wasn't it? You know, they were kind of advancing quite yeah. a lot with each release. And then um, Missile Command 2 that got cancelled. And that's a really interesting story about why that kind of never made it to market, even though there are a few in collector's hands. So, um, yeah, really interesting chat. And I love it when we go real old school, kind of back to the beginning of the industry. So you're going to really enjoy this week's guest. Well, it is, isn't it? You know, back to day one, pretty much. So Rich Adam, our special guest, Atari legend, will be on the show in around half an hour from now. Now, we are getting ready. Um, Joe's packing his suitcase with his tiny whiteies and his (laughs) Superman pyjamas ready for next weekend. Thank you. (laughs) Superman pyjamas is correct. (laughs) (laughs) Because we're off to Norway next weekend. Oh, yeah, it's going to be insane. I'm I'm really excited about that. And you know what? It's like 
events are coming back and we're actually mm. getting out and going to the isn't this the first time that you've uh, left the country since the uh, covid thing joe uh yeah it is actually um much to my wife's Get another plane remember that i know what's that all about <laughs> we were you two bloody referee bites as well <laughs> yeah no i'm really looking forward to this we're going to be at retro messer on friday the 19th we fly out we're going to be there on the saturday and the sunday um we're going to have a table there as well aren't we for like doing trading and meet and greet and then we're also going to be doing a few of the talks presenting them and then we're going to do our own talk as well aren't we yeah Yeah. on the sunday on the sunday which is really exciting um make sure that we're not too drunk or anything like that or too hungover should i say it's gonna happen i'm sure we will i know you're trying to prevent it but it's gonna happen (laughs) i know i've already said i'm not drinking because i'm going to this new mysterious country i've never been to before so you know i'm gonna try and you know play it safe and you guys are just like nah no, nah, nah, it's nah. part of the no culture chance. you've no got chance. to. An- another place where we're going to be doing a lot of drinking as well is Amiga 37, which is going to be happening in October the 15th and 16th. Me and Dan will be heading out to Germany and uh, Dusseldorf. This this looks exciting, doesn't it? The, the big Amiga show that last time I went there, it really kicked off. Um, and this was just before the pandemic. And there was, I'd say there was like a thousand people over the weekend, which was just insane. I've never been to one of these big, huge German shows. Uh, you were there as well, Joe, uh, Dan. What did you think of it? Yeah, well, it was a first kind of, you know, I've been to the Amiga event in Amsterdam and the one in the UK as well. But yeah, I think you're right. This one was just off the scale. It felt like it was like 1992 or something. Yeah, the amount of people, like they were queuing around the stopped. block to get in. No. Yeah, it was crazy. And the amount of new hardware and stuff as well. And already I've been reading, you know, about um, new hardware that's going to be launched there this year. There's already a lot of announcements kind of bubbling under. So if you're an Amiga fan, that's going to be massive. And actually, you're, you're doing like a, a a club night as well, aren't you? On the yeah, Saturday night, so you're going to be DJing a, in a club? There's a club called Project 42, and um, we're going to be DJing there. And I'm going to be joined with DJ Hoffman as well. And we're going to have like a, a room. And also there's going to be Chris Holsbeck. Uh, you know, the legend who did the Turrican soundtrack, the Fast Loaders as well, who do like heavy metal, Amiga kind of soundtrack. So this is going to be a mad event. I'm, I'm really excited about this one. But also, wow, there's a lot of events. We've got a local one that is going to be coming in the 17th and 18th of December. And this one's really interesting um, because Nottingham, uh, where we actually record this podcast, has it's kind of had a bit of a a vacuum that needs to be filled with uh, video gaming because we had the National Video Game Arcade that used to be here and it left to Sheffield. And and Mm. once they left, all the other video gaming stuff kind of left. So there's been this huge gap of people just wanting to do stuff in Nottingham. And uh, Nottingham Video Games Expo is an event that is starting on the 17th and 18th of December. Um, Sacred Powered are involved. Dreamcast Junkyard, our friends there as well. Centre of Computer... Uh, History, uh, Robin Hood Amiga Group, Parallel Universe, and uh, there's a lot of people there. And uh, it's more, this is more like a kind of community event where they're bringing all these different community groups together and trying to do something in the Midlands. Yeah, we're going to be on stage hosting a couple of panels there as well, aren't we? So um, a brand new event. If you're anywhere in Nottingham, that's coming up in December. So uh, plenty of events coming up. If you want to come and say hello and uh, join us for any of those, I'll put links to get tickets in the show notes on your app or at theretrohour.com. Right then, a busy week for news. So let's jump straight into the stories that have been making the headlines over the last seven days. Uh, Now, this is pretty cool because, you know, we, we often use emulation when we need to, even though I think us guys are probably a bit more purist than the average gamer, you know, having large collections of consoles and old machines. But now, if you want to play classic games on Steam, they now officially support the Switch's retro controllers. Yeah, I think this is really cool. So this was an update on July 27th, which I've only seen kind of popping up over the last couple of days. I didn't see this until now. Um, but essentially, they just they just added a simple statement on Steam that Steam has now added support for Nintendo Online Classic Controllers. However, a spokesperson has now confirmed this does specifically refer to the NES, the Super NES, the N64 and the Mega Drive official Switch controllers, um, which are fully compatible with Steam now, which I think is really cool. Obviously, (laughs) some of these controllers have only got like four buttons and three buttons and stuff like that. So, you know, I don't think you'll be playing you know, the latest Call of Duty on your NES controller. I mean, you could give it a, a damn good try. There's a YouTube video to make. <laughs> um, but obviously, it's it's particularly, it is essentially aimed at indie titles and obviously 
retro games. There's a lot of retro games on Steam and you can get a lot of retro game packs where you get like, you know, the humble, hum, I think they're called like humble bundles and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if that's still a thing, mm. but where you get all the all the bundles with all the retro games and stuff there specifically for that. But um, it does support complete button mapping in there. So you can map yeah. the buttons as you please through Steam on them, um, which I guess will make them a lot easier to play with. Have you tried the button mapping before? So I was a big fan of the Steam Link, which was a really good piece of software where you'd actually stream it and you would be using Steam as a platform, but you connect with like the Xbox One controller. Now, the cool mm. thing about that was you had profiles that people would create. So mm. they would obviously have custom profiles. You could load them in as the key maps on Steam. So it would be like, I want GTA to play like GTA used to, but using the Xbox One controller. So right. the idea of this is, you know, they'll be mapped ideally to the um, kind of console, but also you'll have tons of user profiles that will start coming out. Like, you know, you'll have an N64 controller map and maybe there'll be like a different way of doing it or something or a different way of playing it. And it's really customizable. Like if you've not actually used it within the Steam client, it's hard to kind of explain, but um, mm. it's it's kind of like user created content of key maps and yeah uh, like this is how i like to play and then people yeah. vote on so, it and stuff so it's, 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 it's essentially people's presets that they've 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 said try playing this game with this preset on the n64 yeah. and, you, and you've kind of you don't have to do the work you know yeah. you just get it go oh great it's playing like it should you know and uh as this comes out more and more profiles will get added to this and it's going to start to grow and i think it's great on steam as well because you're right, we're seeing a load of retro games that are coming out on this platform. And it's not one that I thought, you know, Steam is going to be the place for retro gaming. But yeah, it really is. We see stuff like getting distributed on Steam, but also then you can get it on your original console and stuff like that as well. You know what, as well, trying to play a game designed for the Mega Drive on like an Xbox controller or even or even worse, a keyboard, it just never feels right, does it? No, and that was the problem, like especially with like mm. the Xbox One and stuff. It was like you were trying to play these really old titles and it just didn't feel quite right. And everyone tried to get it to feel right, but with these pads, I think it's really, really going to help. Although I've got to say, you probably already need to own one of these pads because I've been looking for about a year to try and get hold of a Mega yeah, Drive pad for my Switch. These are hard to get hold Impossible. of, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. yeah you've, got, you've got to be like a Nintendo Online subscriber and then there's like a link on their store. But I think, yeah, I remember looking, the N64 ones came in stock God, probably about a year ago and I think they were in there for about 20 minutes and they all sold out. Wow. I guess this is the official ones as well. It's not going to be like yeah. 8-bit do and stuff like that. No, but, no, it's It's the official licensed Nintendo ones. Like Dan says, you know, you've got to be a member to buy them and all this. So, mm. um, But you're completely right. You know, the original S- SNES and the NES ones came out in uh, 2019 and they're still yeah. pretty hard to get a hold of, I believe. So, But like probably you said, the S64 and Mega Drive ones came out last year and I don't know anybody who's got them. No, <laughs> probably a, a dealio between Steam and... Uh, you know nintendo and they've probably oh, put yeah. this up together but yeah pretty cool though yeah so if you've got one in your collection you want to get a bit of extra use out of it um a nice little addition to steam that should be available now now did you guys ever own a nokia phone back in the day didn't everyone i did i, I certainly did i had a nokia 8210 funny enough and the 3210 before that well yeah. if you miss your nokia 8210 you can actually buy a new one now it seems because you know nokia did this with the 3210 a couple of years ago, didn't they? Yeah. I lose track of who owns Nokia now. Is it still Microsoft? No, I think it was a new company that bought them. But uh, yeah, they have been releasing these like new versions and uh, people like look for simplicity and stuff. And I think uh, the battery life on the phones were really good and uh, the kind of simplicity of them. And it's, it's like a brand that we've also forgotten about. But uh, this one's got like 4G connectivity, right? Yeah, so this is the Nokia 8210 4G. That is the official... Uh, remind people what the, the Nokia official. 8210 was. Which one was that? It was the... Um, was it the tiny one? It was the smaller one, yeah. It was... Um, how do I describe it? We're on a podcast here. I've got to remember. <laughs> it was it was the red one. It was, you know, the one with the shells. They were always red or silver. C- help me out here, Dan. <laughs> I, I'd say it. I remember it being described as like the candy bar phone because it was like yeah. smaller. It was you know, like a fun size Mars bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was a little one. Played Snake on it loads. I, I feel like I played, played the Space Invaders game out on there as well a lot. 
Um, but it was the really small one. Yeah. And they were always, mine was red. Um, they were always like red and orange and blue. A really colourful uh, phone. And they were so popular like, what, around 2003, maybe a little bit earlier or later. Um, but yeah, this is the re- the, the re-release, inverted commas, um, which is described by Nokia as having a fresh new update and look. So ultimately, it is like the same size phone and looks very, very similar. But they've obviously updated it to support 4G. So it doesn't support 5G by the looks of things. It's just 4G, hence the name 4G. Mm. Um, and it's 64.99, so it's not going to set you back too much compared to oh. like a, you know, compared to some of these modern phones. But obviously, um, I think. As you say, Ravi, it's it's the name and the nostalgia of it, and essentially, it's <laughs> one of its big selling points is it's got a big battery and big performance. So it boasts that it'll actually last up to two weeks on one charge um, when you're oh, not wow. when you're not uh, when you're in standby mode, and then I think it says it's got nine hours of talk time in it. So well. I I kind of went down a YouTube rabbit hole, and it's going to be a lot cheaper to do this and a lot cooler. Um, if you look for a channel called Jaina Cycle, they're basically modifying the firmware on the original Nokia. So like the 3310, they've added a load of new games on there. You have to kind of make a custom cable to flash it and mm-hmm. uh, you use your PC's parallel port. If your PC still has a parallel port, <laughs> you, know, you probably need a retro Mine one. Mine do. Yeah, <laughs> but they've, um, they've made new games on there, like a 3D maze and stuff. They've updated it. But I've also seen a wireless charging one on the original Nokia. So it's got the kind of wireless charging pad and you can put it on a wireless charger, which is pretty insane. So, uh, yeah, I've seen some cool LED mods as well and stuff. So people are still modding the old school ones and there's a lot of love for those. And uh, they've got like Minesweeper on there. (laughs) So if if you actually drill down on the website into the uh, the specs and go to performance, it does actually say that if you're on standby mode, on 4G, so I'm guessing standby mode means it's not really being used. It will last 27.3 days on one charge. Okay, so. that's good. Yeah, that's that's like like the old ones. Um, yeah, you know, you could you could lose it for two weeks and still give it a ring. And uh, yeah, and it'll <laughs> yeah, still it work. work. Yeah. Um. So it boasts a uh, in, an incredible internal storage of 128 megabytes. Uh, but it does <laughs> like one picture. Yeah, it does have a micro SD card support of up to 32 gig. It's got a two inch screen. I believe, a two-inch full-colour screen, and it does have a camera on there, but I have dug and dug and dug to try and find the uh, specs of the camera, and there is nothing on their website from what I can see. I found it. It is 0.3 megapixels. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so that proper nostalgic mid noughties look. No, the, the, the killer feature is the FM radio, because I, yeah. I remember <laughs> sitting there, and the headphones would be used as the aerial. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'd sit there and I'd be tuning through pirate radios whenever I went through London and I'd be like, oh, drum and bass on my phone. <laughs> <That was laughs> like... Holding your headphone wire up to the sky to try and yeah, get so that's it. it. Yeah, as I the tube that. went onto the overground, <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. I can listen to music. Um, I think one thing that got got me is one of the features, um, you know, obviously it's like buttons and full colour screen and all that kind of jazz. Um, removable battery. Which is just like, I mean, I know for some phones you can still do that, but, you know, I just remember always doing that for some reason when I had old Nokia phones, like just fiddling with it, like pulling the battery out and stuff like that. Not something I I do with my iPhone. uh, I hope they've got cases and uh, you can get like an old Ali G, like big gun (laughs) for something like that. Unfortunately, I don't think they do. It just comes in red, dark blue or sand. But Um, yeah, a little bit of Ali G or a Zelda one or... You know, a yeah, Star that's Wars a whole, one. <laughs> whole third party market there. That yeah, that was created. Be, just market the stalls. Cases, yeah. yeah, on the market stalls that your mum would take you to on a Saturday morning. Uh, 2.8 inch screen as well, which is really And an MP3 player built in as yeah, well. Yeah, built so in MP3. Score your favourite thing. But you do need to have the, the SD card for that. So, do you think you'd be buying one, guys? You know, I'm looking at this. The one thing that really is nostalgic to me is obviously there's a lot of new features in there as well, but it still has the. Is it. T9 keyboard, you know, the predictive text. So you actually type by pressing the keys, you know, like if you want to get an A, it is number one. Oh, yeah, is yeah. A, yeah, number two, isn't oh, it? Oh, I didn't even feel Yeah, it does. I, I, yeah. You know what? And, it didn't and I even guess occur to me. It's a physical numpad as well, yeah. which is a, a rarity these days. But I've got a Nokia 3210 in a drawer, so I don't really need this. It's probably still charged. 
could probably still switch it <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be able to type so quickly on those predictive text mm. keyboards, though. And I remember that I think there was actually kind of um, <laughs> like world record championships and stuff they used to do in certain places. They did, Where, yeah. you know, people would go on stage and actually uh, yeah, try and beat each other's scores. So that's very nostalgic. I don't know quite how good I'd be trying to use one of them today, but I, I could I, get I, pretty quick on them. I'm right trying there. to, like, you know, feel it in my mind. My mind's eye, kind of feel it on my thumbs. And I feel like I'd still be pretty quick at it, you know? That's Dan's yeah. uh, next video, A Week Living on a Nokia. Yeah, <laughs> I did actually do that probably around five years ago, maybe, because I still have an old Nokia, but then my iPhone broke and I had to um, return it to Apple. So I was without it for about four or five days. So I did use a Nokia. In a way, it was quite nice not to be constantly nagged all the time, mm. you know, not having yeah. alerts wherever you are. Well, You've got very G, disconnected. So it's going to nag you quite a bit. Yeah, well, I'm looking here. I mean, does this? I'm not sure this thing has like an app store. You know, whether you can get Twitter and Facebook and all that. They don't really mention anything about that, so I'm guessing probably not. It looks a bit more like a dumb phone. Yeah, I don't. It doesn't um, mention anything, so I don't think you can. It literally. So in a way, it, it's quite nice. You know, sometimes just to yeah. be a bit disconnected. Oh, if you go on a holiday, I imagine this would be quite. So good. I have. I'm just scrolling through the website. On it doesn't say anything, but on one of the images of the phone being used, it has got a Facebook app on there. Ugh. Yeah. No escape. no escape. I'm taking my uh, 3210 to Norway. And there you go. be the only phone he <laughs> <laughs> Where's Ravi? I can't get him on his Nokia. <laughs> I haven't got WhatsApp. <laughs> he can't get Google Maps if he's lost. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you do want to get hold of one of these old school Nokias again, I think I think there are legit reasons for these. I mean, somebody might just want a, a second phone for work or maybe want to leave in the car. This would be quite good, you know, if it stays charged for like a month. Having one in like your, your glove box in your car for emergency use, I imagine. Yeah, or quite, if you like hiking, mountain climbing, and you need something for emergency. So, yeah. yeah and if it's like the original Nokia's, you could probably, you know, Chuck it. drop it off a mountain <laughs> and it would survive. So, <laughs> so looks like they're available now from uh, Nokia's official store if you want to get hold of one. Now, it's not very often that we find out new things about very famous games almost 30 years after their release. But it turns out, did you ever play Super Punch Out? on the Super Nintendo back in the day. I never have played it, but it's the it is the sequel to Punch Out, which I have played. Mm. Um but Super Punch Out is the Super Nintendo one and it's the one where like it's it's the view of it is where you're like the green wireframe, isn't it, from behind. And then, you know, obviously you're fighting your opponents and stuff like that. I think I might have briefly played it on the Switch, you know, on the Super Nintendo um store thing they've got on there, but that's it. Well originally it was only a one-player game, mm. or so we thought. Yeah. But it turns out someone 28 years later has found out there is a secret two-player mode that you can enable in here so you can now play this game with a friend. This Now, this... we're getting the specifics of how that works, but it's just crazy to me that, number one, this has just been found now, and number two, they didn't enable this when the game came out or publicise it. That just seems like these games are always a lot more fun with a friend. Yeah, this this is really baffles me. So this comes from a Twitter page on listed cheats. Um, who I guess it's the you know name is in the title. They find cheats that you know haven't been discovered before. You know, and, and like and as as you say, it kind of starts off explaining that there is modes within the game which were never publicized, and it it's baffling and it baffles me that these weren't made clear that these modes are in it. So there's like a a one on one kind of like fighter select mode in it. Uh, where at the title you hold Y and R and then press A or start and a screen will appear where you play as, you know, the player one character and you can pick whoever you want to fight, even from kind of like the special circuit bosses which are available in the game to fight as well. Like you can pick anybody you want to fight rather than... Because normally you, you only play as Little Mac, don't you? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Original, yeah. And then you fight through everybody, but you can just pick anybody just for a one-on-one -on -one fight rather than kind of going through a story of the game. Um mm. And That's it's just insane. It's just baffling that wasn't e that the, that that wasn't even in the game, even as an unlockable. Once you complete the game, it's like okay, you can now go fight anybody you want to fight. Um, but then, as you say, it then goes on to say that actually, if you connect player two and press, is it then do the same combination? That Joypad two will take over the com the computer and it will be two player, which is just insane. Yeah. And I think, like, you know, Game Genies have been out there and stuff. Like, how how have people not found this before, you know, or people inspecting the code and stuff like that? It, it takes till 2022 for people to actually 
you know, discover this pretty amazing. And I think one great thing about that is obviously, you know, you can play with a friend, but also like you mentioned then, Joe, you can, you can actually play as these previously computer controlled only characters. Yeah. Yeah, you, which is it unlocks a whole new roster of characters for you. Yeah, exactly. There's like I think 24 characters or something like that, or maybe a few less. But you you can't play as as a, I think there's 16. Sorry, but you can't play as any of them usually. And now all of a sudden you can select anybody to fight against, and then player two can just pick up the controller and press the code as well, and and it will work. And you know what's really cool, which so it should work, is it works on the Switch version of this game as well. You just mm. you know you press the same buttons, the mapped buttons. And it will work on the Switch version as well. The only thing I can think of is it was in there for development reasons for the devs, you know, to make sure the moves moves work and stuff like that, and you know, make sure that the game kind of plays properly. You know, rather than having to go through the entire game every single time to get to a certain enemy, to a certain opponent, um, they put it in there so you could just boot the game up and play. That's my speculation. I've not read anything about that or anything. But that's the only reason I can think it was in there, but. Once again, coming back to it, it just baffles me that it wasn't an unlockable once you completed the game. And it's not yeah. like Super Nintendo didn't have battery save and stuff like that. It's just insane. And I, and I think, like, imagine how many games probably have these modes or hidden cheats oh, that are yeah. still being found, like, years later. This is this is pretty crazy story, to be honest. Yeah, and I think the biggest oversight there is, you know, they could have sold that as a two-player game. Yeah. Which, you know, consider it was there must have been a reason why they didn't. And it's just, yeah... I want to know why, but I don't think we're ever going to find out. <laughs> Considering this is like been kept secret for twenty eight years, but there you go. If you ever want to play Super Punch Out, um, might have to ring my little brother and say, "Remember that game we started thirty years ago? Play it together." Again <laughs> I'm going to come fight you on uh, it. Yeah, so it's uh, th- there's a link to um, all the moves and everything that you need to do. Um, they're on Twitter, so I'll link it up. The article on Kotaku's got them all, and you'll find that along with the rest of the stories in our show notes at theretrohour.com. It's been a bit of a lively week on our Patreon this week, hasn't it? We posted a little topic up there for something quite exciting that we're going to be doing for our uh, patrons' exclusive podcast in a couple of weeks' time, um, which is the Retro Hour After Hours, a monthly podcast that we do just for our patrons. And we asked them to pick some games for us to play, and the response has been pretty overwhelming so far. It just seems everybody wants me to play Dizzy. Like <laughs> yeah, the amount you of comments. To play you, Dizzy. Like just Joe needs to play Amiga and play Dizzy, which I knew would happen. So Dan sorted me out. He sorted me out. He's going to set me up. And then I've obviously got to, you know, say that I love it, obviously. Otherwise I'll be castrated and, you know. <laughs> otherwise I'm ringing the Oliver twins up and sending them around. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so I know, but I'm really excited for this. I think um, we should have done this much sooner. I think we did it for each other mm. on a really early episode a couple of years ago. Um, of the after hours, which was really fun. We really loved it. And I've actually been like, oh yeah, it'd be great if we do that again. And then, you know, I think one of you guys said, let's get the community to do it, you know, get the Patreons to tell us what to play. A few squeamish games for Ravi. We found out this week Ravi doesn't like blood. And, uh, oh God, couple, uh, yeah. A couple of people want you to play a few violent games, don't they? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of titles that I've actually not heard of in this, but uh, also God of War, like um, there was that section, I remember where you're climbing the mountain. And mm. uh, or, or is it like a giant person that's like a giant creature's a mountain? And I felt so sick when I was playing that. Um, <laughs> so God of War is one that I'm going to avoid, and unless you want to hear about that. But um, yeah, there's some amazing suggestions, and it's great actually getting games from the listeners and stuff because we've got our own bank of memories, you know, kind of games that we've played. But everybody else has their own individual ones, and you know, titles that have been underrated and stuff. So it's really nice and. Uh, you know, it's great to have this patron community. Yeah, so if you'd like to, um, we think we might get a few episodes out of this because we've had quite a few of them. So if you'd like to add your game suggestion, maybe it's a game that you think, you know, maybe it's something you love that you think you'd like us guys to play and give a little review on the After Hours podcast. We'd love to do that. You can join us on Patreon right now. If you're a gold member or above, you get the After Hours every month and you'll unlock the previous 26 episodes. You get all of those as well. You get the normal podcast um, early most weeks. You get it ad-free as well. You get extra patrons exclusive content. We do like another 10, 15 minutes of news on our patrons edition of this show. And really the main reason you're doing it is to uh, keep the lights on and just make sure that we can keep bringing this podcast out every single week for you, every Friday, bringing these amazing guests, keep you up to date on the news. And also you'll be invited to 
our patrons hangout that we do normally on the last Thursday, uh, last Sunday of the month. So another one of those coming up in a couple of weeks' time. And all you need to do is join us on Patreon. All the details are at theretrohour.com. And I'm very pleased to say we have a couple of new patrons this week. So let's give them a mention in the world's most prestigious high score table. That is... Hall of Fame. The Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And a big thank you to our two new supporters this week. That is Todd Hensby. And James Ash who both joined us on Patreon. We massively appreciate your support. And if you'd like to do the same and join the Retro Hour community, all the details are at theretrohour.com. Now, we all love Sonic the Hedgehog, and it is very cool, the amount of fan projects that we've seen over the last few years. I think, you know, out of all of the classic gaming franchises, Sonic has not only got the most committed, but also the most talented of the fan communities. The amount of games they bring out that seriously could have been AAA Sega games back in the day, they're that good. And there's a new one now, um, a game that was previously only available on the Game Gear, and this is Sonic Triple Trouble that's now had a massive update. Yeah, so this looks really cool. So this has actually been essentially ported to 16-bit, essentially using a lot of the, I guess, the best assets of Sonic 3, maybe a little bit of Sonic Mania in there as well. But this looks, it looks beautiful. This just looks like Sonic and Knuckles, Sonic 3, like Lost Levels, just like a lost game that came out in 1996 or something. Um, Dan, you've actually downloaded it and been playing it, haven't you? Yeah, at the moment, I mean, it's a work in progress. Mm. um, And there's a demo that you can watch on YouTube. It's only like a a 60-second trailer. Mm. But if you go onto their website, they've they've actually put a um, a playable demo up there. So you can download that from uh, gamejolt.com. I'll put the direct link in the show notes, but um, yeah, this has not been released for, even though they do say it is a 16-bit game. Of course, the trailer you watch it, it says, you know, the game originally came out on the Game Gear, but what about if it came out on the Mega Drive? Mm. So that's kind of what this is, you know, meant to look like, but actually you play it on your PC. Yeah. So it's a downloadable Windows EXE file that you can play on, you know, Windows 10, Windows 11, and uh, yeah, the first couple of levels of the game are on there to play. I mean, I only got past um, the kind of intro of the game and then you, you fight one of the first times you meet Eggman in the game of, of, of several and then you kind of go into the uh, the proper first level. But it looks like there is quite a bit already in here. I mean, looking at the screenshots, there's at least like four or five levels mm. that they've um, screenshotted in here. So I'm not sure how long this demo is, but the fact is that this is a fan project. Yeah, it's, I imagine, you know, they're going to keep updating this and it'll be, it'll be free. It's really interesting because I've never played uh, Triple Trouble. And uh, no, same. yeah, it, it, it feels like a whole new kind of title or add on to my kind of a uh, limited solid knowledge. And it just looks really beautiful. It's got the kind of palette done really well. It definitely looks like a Genesis title here. Well, that that's interestingly what they've tried to do is what they're claiming is, uh, you know, they're calling it a Genesis. It's obviously American, but it's Genesis accurate. So they are using all the same kind of sound files and they're using the same yeah. the same colours they've got. You know, um, I, I don't know the official words for it, but they're using the same palette, essentially. So it really does capture that 16-bit Sonic look. And, you know, I think it just looks just like Sonic 3, um, but just really unique levels. You know, you're kind of running through a Green Hill-looking zone, but with like a beach in the background, which I think just looks really awesome. Um, and I really like the bonus stage, which is obviously based on the bonus stage from the original version of Triple Trouble, but it just looks like they've had to completely kind of build that from the ground up because of it doesn't really look like any of the bonus stages which are in the 16-bit Sonic games. So it's just a real, I say it all the time, but a real passion project. And I really hope it, you know, it'd be amazing to see a full release because obviously we have kind of seen that kind of stuff from Sega before with a few people, you know, I mean, look at Sonic Mania, you know, how that started and everything. Yeah. So it'd be really, really cool to see this come something more than just, you know, a demo. Well, that's the thing, you know, these things are actually given life to to live and to grow, whereas if it's a Nintendo one, it would be do it or (laughs) release it, it gets taken down. You know, but um, like Dan said, they've got a great modding community with the uh, Nintendo, uh, with the Sega fans, and uh, they seem to actually embrace that and, uh, you know, let these things happen. And it's got all the right legal warnings at the beginning and stuff, and uh, they seem to be doing it correctly. It's a fun game as well, because I, mean, I didn't play it. Did you play it on the Game Gear originally, Joe? Have you played it before? I feel like I've played it because of, we had a Game Gear when I was very young, and we had like a good handful of Sonic games for our Game Gear, and I feel like I have played I feel like we either had this one or we played it. 
Unfortunately, we were burgled when I was about six years old and the yeah. Game Gear and all the games were gone. Uh, and then we got a Game Boy after that. But um, I feel like I have played this. It does look really, really familiar. Yeah, to me, I mean, the only Game Gear version I played the original one. So to mm. me, this kind of feels, especially having it, you know, kind of upgraded like this, it feels like a brand new Sonic game mm. to me. And, you know, you've got a lot of the physics in there from the latest Sonic games have put in. And also you can switch between Sonic and Tails in real time as well, which yeah, is quite cool. Really cool. Well, I I, um, I got this uh, Game Gear and I think it was quite dodgy. It must have been from, a, you know, a theft of a house or something like that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I did try it Around tw- about 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah about <laughs> The only thing I'm wishing, though, is because I played this on my PC for a bit and I thought oh, it would be so cool if they actually release this on the Mega Drive. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Which I don't know if there's kind of stuff in here that maybe the Mega... You know, like you play Sonic Mania and I thought that, oh, you know, it looks like a Mega Drive game. Then there's quite a lot in there. Actually, the Mega Drive probably couldn't do. Yeah. Whether there is like, you know, maybe it's a bit too advanced for that. But yeah, it looks like it would be possible from an initial glance and maybe it's something that we'll do down the line. But um, yeah, so if you... I've got a feeling that probably not a lot of people have played that, you know, unless you're a a Game Gear fan back in the day. So uh, the demo is available to download for free now, and I'll put that in our show notes as well. Now, something you might want to avoid late at night, because um, Joe and I watched this trailer and both had the same reaction. This is, insanely, someone has turned Super Mario 64 into a horror game. This is terrifying, um, <laughs> to say the least. So this comes from uh, user developer CM9 underscore animation who has made another princess is in our castle. Um, so it's a very sad story. You know, Mario 64, Mario's return to Princess Peach's castle. After, you know, a few years after the, the original game, unfortunately, Princess Peach has passed away. Uh, so Mario takes a trip down memory lane and enters the castle with all the lights switched off, first person view with a lantern in hand, to unfortunately be stalked by the ghost of Princess Peach, who I must say... <laughs> is terrifying. I was watching this before we started recording and uh, it was actually me who found this game through Nintendo Life and uh, I added it. I was like, let's talk about this. And I started play- uh, watching the game with my, you know, my setup on. I've got my mixing desk and I've got my headphones on and I'm about a minute into this nine minute. We've got nine minutes of footage here and I'm about a minute into it and Jesus, I jumped out of my skin. I don't want to ruin it. It's terrifying. Yeah, um... <laughs> It's, I find it's interesting because this environment is like one that we've been used to and you feel comfortable and safe. In yeah, it. And oh, you yeah. Know, you've kind of gone around and then to, to kind of have a haunting in there, it's like uh, totally changes the whole dynamic. And it's just like, especially with Peach as well, you know, she's really sound. And then uh, suddenly the ghost is not at all. You know, it's it's really cool. Yeah, because Joe found this story. Yeah, like you said, I was watching it before we started recording. First minute or so, I'm like, oh, this doesn't look that scary. Then something happens, and I was like, whoa, okay. I nearly said to you, oh, this is lame, let's not talk about it, (laughs) until I saw (laughs) that moment that we're talking about in the video. And also the Um, uh, first-person perspective as well really, really, really does change it, you know, just having his hand kind of with a lantern, (laughs) like walking around, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, It really changes the dynamic. You know, I don't want to spoil... I, I've, I've figured out what the aim of the game is and I don't really want to spoil it, you know, for our listeners. So I just I just say go check it out. Um, but looks like a really creepy game. Unfortunately, it is just in the alpha build at the moment. So maybe it will become playable. Maybe Nintendo will shut it down. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, really, really creepy game. Go watch it with the lights off with the uh, headphones on, I, I suggest. Yeah. And there is a downloadable demo if you want to oh, play it, is, it again it on Windows. Oh, it is downloadable, is it? Oh, brilliant. Go get yeah. it and go play it's wi- it. It's Windows only. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not like a ROM hack. It's a version that's re- rebuilt for Windows. Um, so there is a yeah demo of it available on uh, alphabetagamer.com. So I'll put that in our show notes as well. I want, <laughs> I'm going to make I want ra- someone to suggest Raffi to play that for the After Hours <laughs> podcast. It's not gory. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll put that and everything else we talk about. Of course, you don't have to Google around. You'll find all the stories in our show notes at theretrohour.com. So if you are coming to a Retro Messe in Norway next week, we'll see you there. We're going to be there on Saturday and Sunday. Um, Sandyford in Norway. Tickets are available right now. We're going to be on stage with... Um, a few legends are going to be there. We've got a big rare panel that's going to be going on. Johnson John, Duke Newcomb's going to be there, and uh, plenty more as well. So if you want to get tickets, you'll find all those details in our show notes too. We will see you there next week. And next, we are going to be joined by this week's very special guest going inside Atari, Missile Command, all those classic games with Rich Adam. 
You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time for our favourite part of the show when we welcome on a veteran of the video games industry to share some of their memories and their stories about legendary companies, amazing games that they worked on. And this week we're going to be joined by someone who worked for the biggest games company, Atari, and that is the wonderful Rich Adam. How are you doing, Rich? Good, how are you? Very good, thank you. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Now, we always love talking about Atari, you know, kind of going back to, to day one in the uh, the video game scene. But I mean, it's always interesting to kind of find out where our journey started with our guests. So, I mean, for you, do you remember what initially got you into video games or the first time you ever saw yeah. one? Yeah, I mean, the first time I ever saw one was at like a restaurant in Oakland. I was out to dinner with my uh, grandparents and family and we saw a Pong, my little brother and I saw a Pong game. We played a Pong game and it was it was fun and ma- magical and like, you know, mind boggling uh, that it was, you know, seemed so simple and seemed so hard. It's amazing that it seems so hard now. But, you know, so that was my first taste. But really what got me into video games was at the Stanford Coffee House. I grew up in Palo Alto. And so, you know, when I was in high school, I would go uh, go to the Stanford Coffee House and uh, from time to time. Um, and they had uh, a Galaxy game there, which was basically running on a mini computer. And it was kind of Space War, four player, simultaneous. You would, uh, everybody would put in a quarter and the, and the survivor would get to keep his play and and everybody would have to pony up a quarter to to play again uh, but it was four players simultaneous each of your spaceships in the corner it started out in the corner of the screen and you were you know kill or be killed in space and they had all these options like you could have a sun in the center you could have you could scale gravity, you could go negative gravity, you could wrap around at the edge, you could explode at the edge, you could reflect at the edge. It was like so feature rich. It was like mind blowing in, Mm -hmm. you know, 1972 or whatever it was. So, um, so that was really what got me, you know, sort of hooked on what video games, what was possible. You mentioned there that you grew up in a Palo Alto. Um, I read that was quite the tech hub at the time. What was it like at school? Did you get to do any sort of programming or anything like that with school? I did. Um, we had a HP. I think it was three thousand or something. Was mm. you know the at the um, the school district you know offices that sort of computerized some of their probably accounting or I don't know what they did with it. But what it allowed you know them to offer was a programming class which I took and so I we would you know program in basic uh put our programs in save it off to punch tape and you know then feed it in and run it and so you know I wrote a little blackjack program and and such so yeah I did at Palo Alto High I I got to um uh I took a class in in computer programming I mean, obviously, apart from arcade games, pinball machines, you know, they, they were huge as well. Did you have much of a history with pinball machines, and did you find that technology interesting? I did. Um, there was a mini golf place that was a bit of a bike ride for my little brother and I. We would ride down there and uh, was on, you know, right at 101 and Marsh Road in, in Menlo Park. And we'd ride our bikes down there and, and um you know, maybe do a round of mini golf, but then they had a bunch of pinball machines and those, you know, amusement machines where you would shoot the um, shooting games and, and so forth. So yeah, all that amuse, those amusement machines were um, right in my wheelhouse. You at a young age became an intern at NASA. How did it feel being exposed to all this new technology and, you know, learning how to program assembly and stuff like that? Yeah, uh, that was just a massive stroke of luck for me. Mm. You know, I uh, just applied to be an intern, a math intern was, well, I think, the mm. title. And um, I was lucky enough. I mean, the first job I did was like, you know, scribing <laughs> on physical tools with this funky little scribe tool. They, you know, the name of the facility on there so that if anybody stole a tool that they would know, Hey, you took our tool. So Mm. I wouldn't call that the most high tech job in history, but, (laughs) but 
but luck eventually I, I then ended up doing some data entry for some uh, Learjet flights that they would fly into the top of these anvil clouds and take measurements for probably for NOAA or somebody <clears throat> and so I logged all their the Learjet flights but then I was assigned to be an aide of, of a physicist Pete Manley who was working on a telescope control system microprocessor based telescope control system there was a, a telescope in Tucson, Arizona um, that was 50% um, uh, owned by the University of Arizona, 50% owned by NASA. And so mm -hmm. they wanted to do a microprocessor-based control system that you would use to point the telescope. Um, and so, you know, we had the, you know, got this 8080 Heath kit <laughs> uh, box and, and so, uh, Pete uh, let me learn how to program an assembly language. And um, yeah, it was, it was very cool. I mean, you know, just being around, I mean, there was, you know, that project, that department that I was in was in a, uh, in a, in a, a hangar for a C-141 that had a 13 inch telescope installed inside of it. And mm -hmm. so that before Hubble, that was some of the highest science that you could do because they would fly up at 45,000 feet. And these, you know, this telescope sat, you know, would sit on these air bearings that would, you know, minimize the jitter because an airplane is a very jittery thing when it's flying mm -hmm. with all those, you know, jet engines. And so they wanted, obviously, to get good light, you want a stable telescope. And so um, they had these air bearings that were really kind of magical. But in any event, um, they they would, you know, do very high science. And one of the missions they did, they flew down to Australia and uh, watched the occultation of a star, which is when a, um, a planet passes between a star and the Earth. And mm. so the planet that was passing was Uranus. And so um, on that mission, they discovered rings. That's when they discovered rings around Uranus because it, oh, wow. they, the, you know, you know, they all know, the, you know, the math says, okay, at this exact time is when the, the planet is going to block the light. And what they want to do is do a, you know, look at the spectrum of the light that comes through right as it's being obscured because when the light passes through atmosphere, it absorbs certain parts of the spectrum and you can look at signatures to say, okay, this is what's in the atmosphere of a planet based upon the light that gets absorbed in the full spectrum of light. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons they do it. Um, but in any event, they knew exactly when it was supposed to wink out and it winked out early and they were like, what? And so then it came back and then it winked out right on time. And they were like, hmm, wow, if that does it in the same kind of sequence on the way out, uh, then we probably have discovered a ring. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. So, um, you know, that project, you know, I got to work with some, you know, really brilliant people, <laughs> uh, which like a 19 year old kid or something. And so pretty damn lucky. So how did you get your start with Atari? What, what, how, how did that come about? And what was the interview like? <laughs> well, I was at NASA and my year ended up, you know, it was an internship for a year. And, mm. you know, when that was done, actually, my dad told me, you should tell him, do you want to stay on? And I said, of course, I would love to stay on. He said, well, you should ask. And I'm like, I'm an intern. My year is up. They're not going to, they're not going to say, okay. And he said, well, you should ask him anyway. So in the uh, exit interview with Bob Cameron, the head of the department, I just said, yeah, I've really enjoyed my time here. It's been great. And uh, I'd love to stay on if there was a way. And he said, I'll go down and, you know, tell Bob Nagel, I'll kick in the money and we'll keep you around. I was like, okay, sure. So I did that. And I think that lasted maybe six months or something. And then the contractor lost their contract. It, they got outbid by like Grumman Northrop or something. Which I think was just grumming in those days. And um, so, you know, when, you know, I was just extra baggage for some new contractor. So I was out on the street looking for a job. And um, I saw this ad in the, in the, uh, the Sunday San Jose Mercury news, which weighed about 25 pounds and <laughs> 20 of those pounds was classified ads. 
<laughs> for Silicon Valley. And so um, I saw this ad for Atari and I applied and um, ended up getting an interview with Steve Calfee. And, um, you know, I was very green. I didn't, you know, I wasn't a college grad. I had done this assembly language programming at NASA. And um, so Steve said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll try you out as a, as a, you know, novice, you know, new guy, and you can work on pinball machines. I've written this language, pinball, P-I-N-B-O-L, um, pinball operating language or whatever. And Steve had written this language that allowed me to, you know, control, uh, turn on a gate, turn on a light, imp- implement some simple set of rules and such. Mm. And it, it was it was kind of a high level language. It was it, it sort of abstracted the assembly sixty five hundred two assembly language away, and so that's what I started doing. I started uh, there doing some pinball games. I did a little cocktail pin, and I did a um, uh, worked on a game called Queen of Hearts and a number of pinball machines until um, they shut the division down. And then uh, I started making, I started working on games, video games. Why did Atari close down the pinball division? Well, I mean, the it's probably a fair, you know, it's probably a constellation of reasons. But uh, number one, it's interdisciplinary. So it's mechanical, it's electromechanical, it's electronics, it's software, hardware, blah, 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 blah. So I think Atari was fine with any of the non-mechanical thing, but, you know, they had to get mechanical engineers and they had to do all of the stuff that, you know, people in Chicago had been, you know, doing for decades. Some of it is, I think, kind of mechanical wizardry. Uh, that you just learn over time. And so I think Atari had some issues with, you know, having reliability and, and they weren't in Chicago and the whole business was out of Chicago. And so I think there was like a number of reasons there. Plus it was a new business and they were trying to establish themselves in that sector. And, you know, they had very established Bally, Gottlieb, Williams already well established. So, you know, I think there was a number of reasons why they ultimately um, decided that, you know, let's just do video games. They're way more profitable. Well, obviously, um, Nolan Bushnell, an absolute icon in the industry. Um, We've had him on this podcast before, you know, really interesting guy to talk Mm -hmm. to. From your perspective, what was it like working with Nolan? And are there any kind of memories that that stick in your mind about working with him? Sure. Um, when When I was at Atari, Nolan was at the end of his tenure there. So... He was around and he would come to game reviews uh, for the first several months that I was there. You know, he was present, um, but it wasn't for long because his um, he ultimately left after the Warner transaction went through and and he went off to do other things, piece of time uh, mainly. So he wasn't part of the my Atari experience too much, um, but. Uh, after Atari, I, I worked for Sente, which was, you know, a startup that uh, Ed Rotberg and uh, Howard Delman and, and uh, Roger Hector uh, started with, with Nolan's, you know, at Nolan's um, Catalyst group and um, ended up working there. And so, yeah, um, I spent some time. We did a lot of brainstorming up at um, several brainstorming sessions at Nolan's uh, mansion in Woodside. So yeah, we had we had some some fun times, and Nolan's a very creative guy. He was always you know trying to think of new angles, and you know he had some pretty decent marketing instincts. Uh, I would say more than decent marketing instincts. He had some very good marketing instincts, and he was very creative and open to always wanting to have a conversation about what if you know. So that was probably one of Nolan's strengths is just his pure openness to talking about something new with pretty much anybody. He didn't really, he understood that good ideas came from every corner of the world. And what was the culture like in the early days of Atari then? Because that sounds pretty, I wouldn't say relaxed, but that sounds pretty open. Uh, I think relaxed is an understatement. Mm. Uh, I, I think it was very freewheeling. We, we, <laughs> we got away with stuff that uh, there's... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, we we did things. Um, uh, we we worked very hard. Okay, making a game is hard. Uh, you've got you know millions of moving parts that are totally invisible unless you have these really powerful tools that let you see inside the machine that you you're building. And so, and it's software, so it's either perfect or it's totally broken. And so it, it's difficult. And plus there's a million details in, in video game, you know, millions and millions more now than there were back in a simple 6502 based uh, coin operated game, but still a tremendous number of uh, details. And the teams were very small as a hardware uh, engineer. There was a software engineer and there was a technician typically in the early days. So you had three people and you had to play this game all the time. And if you had a good game then everybody else wanted to play it, which was always a good sign. Um, but you had to test the bejesus out of it. So finishing and, and making a game is, is really hard. So we did work hard, but in tandem with that, we, we did play pretty hard. There was, you know, we would do, you know, every maybe once a month or something that, get a keg of beer in the in the back courtyard and and we'd have kind of a friday party and then maybe after that people would go out for drinks you know after that and so th there was um there were some hijinks that went on that um would not be allowed to happen in today's modern culture <laughs> let's just put it that way <laughs> You mentioned Ed Rotberg. We had him on recently, and he mentioned that he went to um, his first interview wearing a suit and then suddenly realized what a mistake that was when everyone else was in shorts and T-shirts. Yeah, well, <laughs> I saw Ed last weekend. We, he and I went to a concert together. He and her, his wife and my wife and I met up in Bata City and, uh, for a concert. And, um, yeah, he mentioned that uh, he had talked to you. But, yeah, I mean, Rotberg, whether he was going to be wearing a suit or not, you know, um, it, just because you're wearing a suit, you're still at Rodberg, and you're gonna you're gonna ace the interview. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, let's talk about one of Atari's most famous games. Then, how did the concept of Missile Command come around? So the story of that is, um, I was asked to uh, attend a meeting. I was kind of between projects. Uh, I was kind of messing around with some uh, voice. Um, you know, digitized voice thing, just kind of playing with the idea of using digitized voice in games. And I think there was, it was done in a baseball game where, where he would call balls and strikes and such um, for Atari baseball. But uh, in any event, uh, the meeting was in Lyle Raines's office and it was uh, Lyle and Steve Calfee, me and Dave Toyer. And I think Dave Story, who was like the supervisor of the technicians. And so Lyle, you know, started the meeting and said, well, we want to kick off a game project. And I think we want to have maybe have two programmers on this game project because it's kind of an important game project. And, and here's the idea. And he held up this um, Byte magazine or some computer graphics magazine. I don't know what it was, some, some industry rag. And uh, he opened it to a page and he, and he said um, that Gene Lipkin, the VP of sales, had handed that to him and said, I want you to make a game that looks like this. And he, it just had this, you know, it was color raster and kind of, it looked like some kind of radar uh, representation of using color raster. And, you know, it had like maybe four, maybe eight colors. I mean, it was incredible. And uh, so he said, make me a game that looks like this. And so, you know, Lyle said, okay, well, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to have these missile trails that are going to come down from the top of the screen, and you're going to have these bases down at the bottom of the screen, and you're going to shoot missiles from your bases at the bottom, and you're going to try and intercept the missiles uh, that are coming in. And you're, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a defense missile defense thing. And um, uh, we said okay, and he said it's going to be color raster and. Well, the other guy that was there was uh, Dave Sherman, actually. Uh, he was the hardware guy. And um, uh, so uh, they had an idea about what they were going to, how the hardware was going to work. We we're going to intercept kind of a very unusual, un infrequently used uh, instruction in the 6502 instruction set. We're going to hijack that. And that was going to be diverted to basically right to the bitmap 
Um, and so uh, that's what we did. We, you know, used that to uh, have a bitmap game and uh, Toyer, Toyer did the bulk of the work. Um, I, I did the sounds, I did the audio, and uh, I did a lot of the graphics printed primitives for, you know, drawing fonts or, uh, you know, drawing the coastline at the bottom of the screen and, and, and such. But, you know, the gameplay side was, was all Dave Toyer. So that's, that's kind of how Missile Command was born. So did it change, did the concept of the game change much from the original idea to the final product, or was it pretty, pretty straightforward and streamlined? No, it was it evolved. I mean, mm. every game usually goes through. Uh, it, it's pretty rare when you just like, yeah, I'm going to implement it, and then it's fun, and then it's done. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty rare. So it was cool to um, intercept the missiles, and with the growing the circular cloud, and when they intersect, and then you get the chain reaction, and and that was all fun. But it was just not quite enough it's like you know pong was enough for a very early primitive game Mm -hmm. but the games now were starting to get to a point where oh you know you needed some kind of smart enemy or something that was just a little bit more so we said okay well we'll do like a submarine that may come up and shoot missiles from lower so that they don't start at the top of the screen. And obviously we'd done the progression where you have more missiles and faster missiles and blah, 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 mm. and, and Merv. Then we thought, okay, well, we'll have missiles that, that break off and they, you know, do Merv's multiple. I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but anyway, it would split off and, and target, you know, multiple bases or, or cities. And, um, and then, you know, we had the satellite that would slide across the screen and that was fun, but it was just not quite enough. And so there was some review and we we're talking, I think it was Kalfi and Toyer and I, and Kalfi was like, I mean, we should do like, a, can we do like a smart bomb or, you know, smart missile or something like that, where the, the explosions had, were all a certain color, you know, each you know, color was a certain value and the flashing color was just a value and the hardware flashed it. It cycled through all the colors very quickly, which made it look flashy. And um, so what we decided to do is like, can we have these smart bombs that like look for in front of it to see if there's any of that flashing color and then it tries to go around and it tries to avoid the clouds. And so Dave said, well, I'll try that. And so, you know, that was the ultimately the thing that, you know, made the game into uh, something that was deep and Mm -hmm. uh, something challenging. And it extended the form of of what Mm -hmm. video games were. That is what people were looking for. I remember going out on field test and, you know, just the fact that it was one of the first color games, color raster games was, you know, (laughs) <laughs> just watching the reaction of people to a color raster game. I was like, Oh my God, color. I knew it was going to, you know, they all, every, the market knew color was coming and now it's here. And so, you know, that the, the fruit was pretty low hanging in those days, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Oh, make a color game. Oh, okay. But that had color and that had, you know, smart enemies and the, you know, so that, that is really what sort of vaulted it into, the status it, it ended up with. Even the input for the game, I mean, using a trackball w- w- worked really well. I mean, was that an idea that you guys wanted from the start? True. Yeah, uh, we did want a trackball from the very beginning. And uh, I think it was Jerry Lycheck was the mechanical guy on that. And of course, it's a ski ball. And well, we had used it on Atari football. So that that was one of the first, I think, Atari trackball games. And so, yeah, that game had sort of uh, allowed us to sort of work out any of the possible kinks or problems or anything like that. And so, yeah, it was it was going to be a trackball game from the get-go, for sure. Yeah, because Missile Command isn't much fun to play with a joystick. You definitely need a <laughs> yeah. trackball for that game. <laughs> no, it's, it's the one thing, the beautiful thing about uh, arcade games is that they, you can have custom controls and do amazing things with either... Uh, like a Star Wars controller, or in the in the case of Tempest, it's just a one dimensional trackball. Essentially, the Whirly Gig is just a one dimensional trackball. <laughs> so 
that was that is the one advantage that arcade games did retain for home game from compared to home games but mm. it, it's getting to be a small advantage <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um did people find missile command quite controversial you know with the kind of theme of like missile threat and nuclear threat did it seem quite a dark concept at the time because of obviously it's it's quite the normal in modern games but at the time nothing really like that had been done much yes it, 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 there was some emotional baggage associated with the idea of playing a game about nuclear war mm. and icons of cities being destroyed at the bottom of the screen is it, it's kind of a dark concept so um there was some struggle um with it i, I made peace with it pretty quickly i mean i you know it's just a game you know people are just having fun they're not really it's not photorealistic you know and so um at, at that point and, and you're not trying to really destroy you're trying to defend mm -hmm. so that also is a sort of uh ameliorating factor so yeah i mean i i, I know dave thought about it and so yeah it, it, it's a, it's a real thing you know i think about it still just uh, but not even not even so much that i mean i i think about it in terms of you know really photorealistic violence and i i, I don't uh, i'm sure there are studies and i probably should confirm or deny they're probably all over the map you could probably find a study that'll back whatever opinion you want but you know super photorealistic you know human on human killing games i don't know my instincts are the question whether that's makes the world a better place or not that'll be the debate that goes on and on i'm sure for yeah. decades to come uh, no, no <laughs> yeah, question but but we did you know, it was it was on the on the mind of that that basic idea was on our minds when we made missile command for sure we're talking about the the components that were in the the arcade cabinets i mean what was kind of the the quality level of those then, and where were you sourcing the parts from i mean were you using like just domestic televisions for it or was it custom displays well, we had several vendors. Wells Gardner was a vendor, and there were there were a number of of vendors um, for monitors, and we would just buy straight up monitors. Um, that ultimately, probably, I mean, they sold probably those monitors to television manufacturers as well. But although I'm not sure how how that part of the business industry works, but um, we did have set vendors for for all the pieces, and, and Atari, you know, had was a high volume operation. I mean. I'm sure Wells Gardner was happy as uh, anything to be selling 30,000 monitors for Missile Command, you know, because I don't know that they were doing high volume, <laughs> that kind of volume for any non-television uh, uh, manufacturer. So, yeah, I think Atari for when it, it had muscle. And so in terms of getting vendors' attentions, so, but, you know, I was just a dumb software guy. I wasn't really, you know, I was just trying to make a fun game and have it not be broken. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how did Super Missile Attack come around? So after Missile Command was done, um, I th I'm pretty sure that right after that, we we're thinking about what do we do with, uh, well, Super Missile Attack is you're talking about, um, the Cambridge, uh, what the heck is the name of the company in, in Cambridge? The knockoff of Missile Command? The General Computer Corp. In the GCC, the, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah, there's a long story about about that where they um, they basically sort of reverse engineered the ROMs and and they made changes and then you would plug in their, their I think they even had a like a daughter board that had extra memory on there or something. And so, you know, they basically reverse engineered it and, and did their own sort of enhancements. And, you know, Atari ultimately said, hey, wait, you're ripping us off. We're going to sue you. And then they said, why don't we hire you instead? So <laughs> kind of an odd thing. But, yeah, I mean, they were just, you know, clever guys, uh, you know, from, I don't know, they were Cambridge, they were probably MIT kids or something. Uh, they they made some you know interesting tweaks to the game and you know sort of made it fun in a different way, so good for them. I was always interested at why it was under the the GCC label and that that explains it. Cause it's I guess back then you know 1981. 
a lot of the industry was still kind of figuring out, you know, copyright and stuff like that. It was still a bit of a kind of wild west, I guess, in that regard. Certainly. Yeah. And I mean, they, um, they, they were probably just, you know, young guys doing stuff in their apartments and say, Hey, we can do this. Let's, you know, and you know, the legal aspect was probably something that they sort of were learning (laughs) after they did it. Um, Maybe, I, I don't know, maybe they were well aware of it, but, but yeah, it was all a very new industry and it was the wild, wild west for sure in many ways. So was there ever any cool Easter eggs in your games that you put in? In Missile Command, I don't remember there being any Easter eggs. Um, in Gravatar, I did, and it's not really an Easter egg that any Joe Blow can do, mm. but if you own one, and you put it in self-test, and you mash all you know five buttons at once. You know, the game will go into God mode, where the shots from the bases will not destroy you. And mm. and I did that as a testing function, so I could bypass. Mm. And then if you go in, just go into the to the warp planet to get to the next uh, level of planets. If you just go in and out of that then you defeat that whole system. And so it's a way, it was a way for me to quickly get through the game so that if I wanted to quickly go to negative gravity, I could do it quickly. If I wanted to go to, you can't see the land, you can only see, you know, the bases, I I could do that too. So, or I could do it quickly and easily. So yeah, I wouldn't call that an Easter egg because Joe Average can't do it, but... um, certainly is a hidden feature they're always fun to discover when um when you do find them in games though. <laughs> Definitely. well when we got to 1982 i mean what happened with missile command 2 then what was the story there the idea of missile command 2 was to do a two-person simultaneous um and you shoot missiles and you defend your opponent shooting who's also shooting and so um Worked on that game for, oh, God, I don't even remember how long, but quite a while, you know, many, many months, which in those days was pretty long. And, you know, I just couldn't end up finding uh, the magic, you know, to trying to do, you know, it was fun to do pure defense, but to run your cursor across and then try and hit the, hit, you know, attack an opponent and and then defend and and then also make it viable as a one player game uh when you make the screen somewhat smaller uh and you have you know an ai opponent who's the virtual you know human on the other side of the monitor um it was just a difficult thing to make work and and honestly you know there was and man, maybe it was just me. Um, the, the there was this sort of emotional, sort of moral thing of like, oh, now I'm destroying somebody else's cities, and it didn't quite feel as clean as pure defense. Now that could be just me, but at the end of the day, you know, the simple answer is is Rich wasn't able to make it really fun enough to to be a viable, uh, manufacturable product. We put it, we field tested it, but it didn't really earn what it needed to earn in order to keep going so yeah i think there are some in collector's hands aren't there are some roms you can play online maybe there are there's uh, i've seen youtube which is another mind-boggling fact that how those those eproms where did they sit for so long and uh Mm -hmm. and such so uh but (laughs) it's amazing what what has lasted i do remember seeing you know youtube of um some somebody playing that game which is mind-boggling must have been kept in a a dark dry place for (laughs) 40 years correct my missile command didn't last that long (laughs) so what were the changes in the team and concepts that happened for gravatar so gravatar was originally it came out of a concept book that you know we would do regular periodic brainstorming sessions and then the ideas that were presented would be uh, were kept in a binder and so uh, Calfee and Lyle I think said you know let's 
pair Hallie and Rich Adam and, and, you know, Hallie will project lead and Rich will program and, uh, they'll, you know, uh, be a team and, and what game do you guys want to do? Uh, so we talked about, you know, our own original ideas or, um, and we went through that binder. Um, and, um, Lunar Battle was, um, what ultimately became, um, Gravatar. It was a Mike Jang, pretty sure it was Mike Jang, um, concept. And the idea was the Lunar Lander, but you have to fight your way to the lunar surface. And so I was like, okay, that's cool. Cause Lunar Lander was fun, but it was very passive. And, you know, the, the depth of that game was sort of, it was, it, it ended, you know, you you land, you're done. And so, um, I was like, wow, you know, this is a game you could do with a lot of different terrains, a lot of different setups, different gravity. Um, you could do, you know, with asteroids controls. I, I just thought this, this is a, you know, this, this game has some headroom. Hallie was more, he wanted to do this weather based game with some bridge and weather was trying to, uh, you're trying to cross the bridge with a train and the weather was trying to, you know, destroy the bridge or whatever. And I was like, yeah, I, I can see how that lunar battle game will work. I, I can see that game. I, I don't, that other, the weather game is very amorphous to me. I did, I, I just couldn't see it. And so we ultimately picked Lunar Battle and, and, uh, did it on XY, started it out on XY. So it was, it was fun. And, and, um, one of the main kind of features kind of happened by accident, which was, you know, one of the coolest parts of that XY hardware was it had this, you know, uh, auto scaling function so that you could draw a an object at various scales and i think i was trying to do something i was either trying to change the intensity and i hit the wrong address and i i was trying to like increment through the intensity to make things fade slowly in and out or whatever and i actually hit the wrong address and it was i hit the scaling function so I was watching this thing, you know, I, it started out really small and then it grew and filled up the full screen and then blasted past the end of the screen. I'm like, wow, I don't even think I knew about that. <laughs> that That is cool. <laughs> I can zoom in. We can like, you know, start out from deep space and come in on this thing. And so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make that happen. So that's how the whole zoom aspect started. And um, so you know, that was the idea we, we went through and, and Mike created a bunch of different landscapes. We did the one basic one and made that one, you know, figured out that, you know what, you can make a fun game here. And, uh, so then Mike came up with all the various different, uh, you know, the underground one and the circular one and, and, um, the, the cave one and, and such. So, um, and then at some point, like color XY became a thing. So, Oh, guess what? We get to be the first color XY game. Yay. Uh, yeah, I, I also thought visually it was a very, very striking game. Gravitar. Cause he had those kind of vector graphics and color as well. I mean, did he need much changes in the hardware to, to accomplish that? No, not really. I mean, the basic hardware for XY was all, you know, it, it was all the same. And, and, uh, the only thing you could do is, you know, then they added it, you know, a register to define, what color you would be drawing until you change that value in the register. So, you know, it's, you would draw things in, you know, the order that you wanted them based upon, uh, the color. And, and so it was, it was pretty straightforward really. And, uh, I remember talking one time about, you know, trying to figure out how to, you know, do collision and, you know, you would always, you know, estimate, try and estimate as, you know, close, closely as possible, which X, Y, you had a much higher resolution than, um, than raster. But, um, I was talking with another engineer going, uh, yeah, okay. So, you know, I can figure out how to do, you know, easily figure out how to do, you know, a square collision, but my ship isn't square shaped. You know, my ship is the same shape it was. And, um, so then he said, well, yeah, and you can do a diamond, you know, shape. And I said, oh, yeah, and if you do both of those, you end up with like, you know, this hexagon, which is kind of a pretty good approximation. And so 
I think we ended up backing into the same way Log did it for asteroids. <laughs> so yeah, that that's uh, those are the kinds of things that happened all the time at Atari, where you would be just talking through problems with other people and trying to figure out how to make stuff work. Well, in Gravatar, obviously, one major element in there was, you know, hence the name, gravity, um, where the, the ship kind of got slowly pulled to the deadly star in the overworld and you had the you know the downward in the side view levels as well i mean obviously that was quite a new concept um and i must admit when i played that game i'm terrible at gravitar now even though i love that game i mean did people find that the, the difficulty curve was a little bit harder to get your head around than something like asteroids for example yes ultimately i think the game was too hard and um i was told in the lab many times owen rubin would play the game and he'd go rich the game is too hard and I said, oh, and come on, have you played Defender? You know, that game is so complicated. That game is super hard. It, this is, you know, it's got the same controls as Asteroids. It's got the, da, 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 and I had my, I had my pat answer. And um, I was wrong. <laughs> I think ultimately the market told me that the, the game was too hard. So was there much playtesting with Atari? Yeah, the, the way it worked, the layout, physical layout for the building at least for coin up downstairs is there was a, a, a series of labs that were all next door to each other, like five labs, I think. Mm. And so, and each lab would have like two game projects in it. And so, you know, the, the typical in the early days, the, the kind of rhythm of work would be that you would code up stuff and you would actually write code on a piece of paper with a pencil um, and you would hand it in to the operators who would then type it in and they would put it into a uh, piece of core memory program, you know, your code into core memory. And then you would go and take your, take that, plug it into your hardware and, and test. And so there was a downtime, right? When you were waiting for your code, Mm. waiting for the operators to give you your your uh, new new rev and so then you would basically troll the labs you know during that time and you'd go mm. play games you'd play other guys games and so that was in that way you know we played each other's games and gave each other feedback and said what if and did all you know all of that stuff and and it was a good way for you to to know that you were actually onto something because it would become hard to get work done because people were on your game all mm. the time wanting to play. But yeah, that, that was probably, you know, sort of by happenstance, one of the um, ways in which um, Atari really did work well. Um, just the basic pace and, and that the pacing of it, the layout of the labs right next to each other, and really the culture and camaraderie and sort of um, collaboration. It was not a competitive thing. Mm. Um, the culture was not competitive in the sense that I want my game to be better than yours. I, everybody wanted their game to be better than yours, for sure. Mm. But not at the extent of, I'm not going to help you. Yeah. Um, so it was a very, very uh, collaborative um team-oriented culture, one of the best cultures um, I've worked in in my career. Uh, a bunch of very young people just, you know, trying to make fun stuff. You know, and I think back to those um, Atari arcade games, the, the prominence of, like, the high score table constantly mm -hmm. showing on the screen when it wasn't being played, and, the, you know, the attract mode as well that was designed to, the demo on screen to, to get players in the arcade over to the cabinets. I mean, how much attention was paid to stuff like high score tables and attract modes? Well, attract mode, very important. I mean, if you think about the market, you know, the, the, the floor in which your product is sitting and competing against others, I mean, you've got your product and it's literally right next to two other products, which are right next to two other products, which are right next to a whole line of other ones. And they're all wanting somebody to put their quarter in. And so a track mode is very important. You know, the game needed to look cool and it's a really difficult environment because guy's going to put in hard cash, probably, you know, didn't have, you know, a quarter was something to a little kid. And so, 
they wanted to put in a quarter and they wanted to start having fun like within 10 seconds. And yeah. they 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 don't read the instructions. Nobody's going to read the instructions. They're just going to start playing. And so, you know, you had to kind of give them an idea about, okay, here's how you play the game. And you wanted it to look cool and fun. And so, yeah, all of that stuff was extremely important. I mean, that's one of the most pure markets I can think of where all those products are just sitting there competing with each other and hard cash goes into them. And it's, you know, the consumer is just uh, making the choice. And so, in, in, and then at the end of the week, you compare your collections with everybody else. I mean, it's, it's a beautifully pure market in that way. And so, yeah, I mean, you want to uh, trick somebody to put in at least one quarter. And hopefully, after they do that, they're going to want to say, oh, I can do better next time. That mm -hmm. was fun. And I can do better. That's what you want. Get in that high score table. Hopefully. Correct. <laughs> Have you played any of the new updated versions of Missile Command and what did you think of them? N not really. No, I, I I mean, I think I played Super Missile Attack way back in, you know, in the day, but um, I, I haven't really dipped my toe into any, any mm. of the new versions of, of Missile Command and, and uh, I, I'm a, I've been doing stuff in more in the modern realm. <laughs> Somewhat. I know that Missile Command has got one of the. Uh, I think it's the accolade of having the the only um, the only game that actually supported the unreleased Atari Jaguar virtual reality headset was Missile Command. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, and obviously, it's a game that you know lives on. You know, the the flashback collections you get, the new Atari VCS. It, it lives on on so many different platforms. It's definitely a, a game that stood the test of time. You know, I was listening to. Um, a remix of the Bob Marley legend album. And there is um, one of the remixes, I think it's punky reggae party. And the very opening of that song, I'm listening to it and, and I'm going, wait a minute. That is the VCS. Those are the VCS opening sounds from Atari that are from oh, wow. missile command. <laughs> it's missile command on the VCS. Because it, um, Rob Fulop did that game and, and, um, you know, he came down to me to talk about the audio and you can just hear, um, and you can hear kind of some of the stair stepping as, as, um, because the processor can't really, couldn't keep up in the same way that the, um, arcade one could because it's just too, it's overwhelmed, um, on the VCS. So you could kind of hear the audio stair stepping. It's a little, sounds a little gargly. The, the the ramping the smooth whoop 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 is not quite as as smooth and so to me to my ear was like wow that is the vcs version of missile command which i i just made me laugh that's right. i'd like to think that bob marley was playing it between uh between <laughs> studio sessions <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i don't know who it was somebody who covered it i mean they did you know they did his vocal track but then they re they did a modern you know, remix. Amazing. Well, have you still got any of your old Atari games or cabinets? Yeah, I'm looking at two. I've got a Gravatar and I've got a Tempest. Nice. Yeah, you ha have to keep some in your collection. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I haven't turned them on in quite a while, but they're, they're, they're sitting sitting there. Well, Rich, it's been incredible reminiscing about your, your time at Atari with you. I mean, what, what are you working on these days then? What's kind of your modern life? Well, um, I'm actually, um, I, I retired about a year and a half ago. So um, I had been working at Activision and, and worked on um, the uh, Spyro the Dragon reignited um, product for mm. uh, Activision. And then there was a... Um, um, a crash it's about time that oh yeah uh, came out and uh, when that product came out i i pretty much thought you know i'm, I'm just going to take a break and so um i may do something in the next year or so we'll see um how motivated i am or how yeah if something comes along i i, I would be if the right thing came along i'd be i'd have an interest but um yeah you know, we've got five acres and I've got some grapes in the ground and um, I'm trying to learn how to make decent wine. And, and um, you know, I'm learning that golf is something to really hard to improve at. 
<laughs> well, it sounds like you're enjoying a well-deserved break, Rich. It's been uh, amazing talking to you, and uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on and being our guest this week. Happy to do it.